Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. Let me give you some background. I had just turned 18 and was feeling pretty good about life. I recently got my driver's license and my parents had gifted me a used Peugeot 207 SW. It wasn't anything fancy, but it was mine, and it gave me a taste of independence that I was really enjoying. Now, I'm not from a super rich family or anything, but we're comfortable. My parents taught me the value of hard work and appreciation for what we have. I was in my final year of school looking forward to graduation and generally just trying to figure out this whole almost adult thing. So there I was, pulling into the parking lot of the local grocery store. It was a pretty standard place. No fancy security or anything like that. When I was getting my shopping cart, you know, the ones where you have to put a coin in to use them, I overheard this kid whining about something. I turned to see a woman and her young son getting out of a fancy BMW. The woman approached me and that's when things started to get weird. She demanded that I give her my shopping cart. I politely refused, explaining that I had already put my coin in. She frowned and muttered something under her breath, but I didn't think much of it. I just locked my car and headed into the store. I could hear the kid complaining about everything. Literally everything. It was getting on my nerves, but I tried to ignore it. I was almost done when I decided to treat myself to some beer, a bottle of wine, and cigarettes. In Germany, where I live, you can buy beer and wine at 16. And everything else at 18. So I was well within my rights. I grabbed the last bottle of this certain wine I liked, and that's when all hell broke loose. The woman from earlier approached me again, at this time stating that she had wanted that bottle. I apologized and suggested she ask the cashier if they had more in stock, explaining it was first come, first serve. That's when she really lost it. She started ranting about being a single mother in a hurry insisting that she deserved the bottle more than I did. I was taken aback and asked her to clarify what she meant. She then accused me of being too young for alcohol and questioned if my social worker knew I was spending money on getting drunk. I was shocked. Who did this woman think she was? I tried to explain that I was about to graduate high school and wasn't on social aid, but she wouldn't listen. Instead, she insulted me, calling me an alcoholic and a failure and even criticized my car as being low level. I spotted my car keys hanging out of my pocket as she sneered at them. I was getting really annoyed now. I told her I didn't know what her problem was, but she needed to leave me alone. That's when things got physical. She tried to grab the bottle from my cart, then actually tried to slap my hand away. I pulled my cart back, telling her to back off. Instead, she lunged at me, trying to swing at my face. Thanks to some basic judo training I'd had years ago, I managed to block her, but she didn't stop there. She swung at me again. Now, I'm not a violent person, but I also wasn't about to let this woman assault me in the middle of a grocery store. Using a basic judo move, I grabbed her wrist and sleeve and used her own momentum to throw her over my back. I didn't mean for her to get hurt, but she landed hard on her bottom. Next thing I knew, she was curled up on the ground, screaming like she was being murdered. People started to gather around and someone called for an ambulance and the police. I was pretty shaken up. I'd never had any run-ins with the police before, and even though I knew I hadn't done anything wrong, I was nervous about what might happen. The police arrived, along with the ambulance. They took statements from me, the woman, who was still screaming and threatening to sue everyone, and a cashier, who had apparently seen the whole thing. They also checked the store's security cameras. It turned out that the woman had actually hurt her hip when she fell. When they were loading her into the ambulance, she was still yelling threats at everyone. In the end, the police told me that her threats were empty and that I could press charges against her if I wanted to. I decided to do just that. I wasn't about to let her get away with trying to assault me. The store manager was pretty cool about the whole thing. He even gave me the employee discount at checkout as an apology for what had happened. All of this over a bottle of wine? Some people really need to get their priorities straight. I drove home in my low-level car, still a bit shaken, but also kind of proud 
of how I'd handled myself. One thing was for sure, my simple grocery run had turned into a story I'd be telling for years to come. In junior high, I knew this guy who had some kind of mental disorder. People often called him names, which I knew wasn't right, but I kept my distance. I was focused on my grades back then. High school hit me like a truck. My attention deficit disorder symptoms, which doctors hadn't been too worried about before, suddenly got much worse. I could barely finish anything and my grades tanked. I fell into a really dark place, feeling angry at myself and isolated. About a month into the school year, this guy from junior high started showing interest in me. Let's call him Jones. He'd already tried his luck with all the popular girls and was running out of options. One day, he approached me in the hallway and asked me out. I politely declined, and he walked away. He'd ask me out on my walk home, and I'd always say no. Eventually, he stopped and moved on to bothering other girls. But then someone spread a rumor that Jones and I were together. It was distressing, and I started getting harassed. One day, a group of jerks cornered me by my locker. One of them deliberately knocked my binder out of my hands, pretending it was an accident. Another one mocked me, calling me names and implying I was involved with Jones. They'd pin me against my locker, calling me names. I felt helpless and alone. That's when I met my friend. Let's call her Rally. She saw what was happening and reached out to me. We became close, but things with Jones were about to get worse. He started following me around school, claiming he'd protect me from the bullies. But whenever something happened, he'd just stand there and watch. I would ask him to leave me alone, but he'd insist that he was there to keep me safe. I could see him watching me all the time. I felt unsafe, and Rally was risking her own social standing just by talking to me. The bullying escalated. One time, they threw a rock at my head while I was walking home. I was bleeding and in pain for the entire 8-kilometer walk. To make matters worse, someone gave Jones my social media information. He started making countless accounts to stalk me online sending creepy messages. I had to keep blocking him. Even my boyfriend at the time had started to abuse me. Raleigh was the only person I could trust. Then one day, Jones crossed a line. I was walking home telling him to get lost when he suddenly ran at me. He covered my eyes and touched me inappropriately. I managed to twist his arm and run away, leaving him behind. I was in shock. I couldn't stop crying. I felt completely helpless. A few days later, I was walking down the school hallway after using the restroom. Jones was at a locker and started walking towards me. I sped up, but he ran to catch me. He pushed me against the wall and tried to convince me to give him a chance. I screamed at him to get off me. A teacher heard the commotion and found me choking Jones. The administrator called us both in. She told us to apologize to each other and instructed Jones to stop bothering me. I was too embarrassed to tell her about the stalking, so we were both let go. Later that day, I was walking home with Rally. We figured it would be safer to stick together. Suddenly, we saw Jones ahead of us, looking angry. He started yelling at me, blaming me for getting him in trouble, and threatening that I would pay for it. Something in me snapped. I took off my backpack filled with about 30 pounds of books and swung it like a helicopter, hitting Jones in the head. He stumbled back, surprised, but I couldn't stop. I kept hitting and kicking him until he was on the ground bleeding and bruised. The damage was severe. Jones ended up in the hospital with a fractured finger, bruises all over his body, two missing teeth, and cuts in his mouth. I had never felt so powerful, but I also knew I had gone too far. In that moment, all the fear, frustration, and helplessness I had been feeling for months came pouring out. It wasn't right, but it was a turning point. After that, Jones never bothered me again, and the bullies at school kept their distance. I wish things had gone differently. I wish the adults in my life had noticed what was happening and stepped in. I wish I had felt safe enough to speak up sooner. But most of all, I wish I had never been put in a position where violence seemed like the only way out. I'm a 30-year-old woman who's always been close to my family, especially my grandparents. My grandfather was a kind, gentle soul who always had a twinkle in his eye and a terrible dad joke ready to go. When he passed away suddenly from a heart attack, it felt like the world had lost a bit of its light. 
The funeral was held in my hometown a four-hour drive from where I live now. I'd moved away for work a few years ago, but I tried to visit as often as I could. This wasn't the homecoming I'd ever wanted or expected. The day of the funeral was a blur. I woke up at 4 a.m., threw on the black dress I'd packed, and hit the road. The drive was long and lonely, my thoughts a jumbled mess of memories and regrets. I wished I'd visited more, called more often, told him I loved him one last time. The service was beautiful, but emotionally draining. My grandmother held my hand throughout, her grip surprisingly strong for someone who looked so fragile. Aunts, uncles, cousins. Everyone shared stories about Grandpa, laughing through tears as we remembered his quirks and his kindness. By the time it was over, I felt hollowed out, empty. But life, as they say, goes on. I had to drive back home that night because I couldn't afford to take another day off work. So, with a heavy heart and puffy eyes, I said my goodbyes and started the long journey back. About halfway home, I realized I needed to stop for groceries. My fridge was empty, and I knew if I didn't get food now, I'd end up ordering takeout all week. So I pulled into a local grocery store around 10 p.m., hoping to make it a quick trip. The store was mostly empty, just a few other late-night shoppers like me. I wandered through the produce section, trying to focus on my task, of finding my mind drifting back to the funeral. That's when it happened. I was staring at the apples, marveling at how expensive Honeycrisps had gotten, when I felt a slight bump against my back. I turned to see a shopping cart and its owner, an older man probably in his early 70s, staring at me. I moved to the side, politely excusing myself, thinking he wanted to look at the apples too. But no, he kept staring. Then he spoke, commenting on my dress. He said it was nice, but suggested it was too early for Halloween. He added that I would look better in color. I blinked, too tired to even process what he'd said at first. Then it hit me. He was commenting on my black dress. On any other day, I might have had a witty comeback or just ignored him. But today? Today I was running on fumes, both physically and emotionally. I looked him dead in the eyes. My face, probably a perfect example of what my friends call my resting bitch face. I was too exhausted to even try to soften my expression. I responded flatly, informing him that I had just come from a family member's funeral. The man's face froze. He stared at me, waiting for, I don't know what, a punchline? A just kidding? But I just kept staring back, my face as expressionless as a brick wall. He left awkwardly a short, uncomfortable sound. I didn't react, I just kept staring, channeling my inner Wednesday Adams. Finally, he mumbled an apology and started to shuffle away. But something in me snapped. Maybe it was the lack of sleep, the emotional toll of the day, or just years of dealing with people who think it's okay to comment on women's appearances. Whatever it was, I found myself speaking again. I explained that my grandfather believed in not saying anything if you don't have anything nice to say. I also mentioned that he taught me that real men respect women regardless of their appearance or clothing. I suggested that perhaps not everyone had a grandfather like mine. The man stopped in his tracks, his back to me. I could see his shoulders tense. I continued, surprised at how steady my voice was. I described my grandfather as a good man who would never have told a stranger how to dress or what colors suited them. I explained that he was too busy being kind, making people laugh, and leaving the world a better place. I told the man why I was at the store so late and why I was wearing the black dress. I said my clothing choices and appearance were not his concern. Then the man turned slowly. He responded in a whisper, apologizing and admitting he was out of line. He acknowledged that my grandfather sounded like a wonderful man. I nodded, feeling tears prick at my eyes. I simply agreed that he was. The man hesitated, then reached into his pocket and pulled out his wallet. He extracted a $20 bill and held it out to me. He asked me to buy some of the overpriced Honeycrisp apples in memory of my grandfather. I stared at the money for a moment, then slowly took it. I thanked him, saying I thought my grandfather would have liked that. The man nodded, then turned and walked away, leaving his car behind. I stood there for a moment, looking at the $20 in my hand. Then I grabbed a bag and filled it with Honeycrisp apples. When I finished my shopping and headed to the checkout, 
I felt a small smile tug at my lips. Grandpa would have loved this story. And somehow I knew he was up there somewhere, chuckling and shaking his head, proud of his granddaughter for standing up for herself, but also for showing a little kindness in return. That was the kind of man he was and the kind of person I hoped to be. As I drove home munching on a crisp, sweet apple, I felt a little less empty. Life goes on, but so do the lessons and love of those we've lost. And sometimes those lessons show up in the most unexpected places, like a late night encounter in the produce aisle. I always longed for a place with a beautiful garden where I could grow my own vegetables and flowers. After years of hard work and saving every penny, I finally managed to buy my dream house in a quiet suburban neighborhood. The house was perfect, a cozy two-bedroom cottage with a spacious backyard filled with lush grass, vibrant flower beds, and a thriving vegetable garden. The previous owner had clearly put a lot of love into maintaining the outdoor space, and I was excited to continue nurturing it. On moving day, I was busy unpacking boxes when I heard voices coming from the backyard. Curious, I peeked out the window and saw a middle-aged woman and her family having a picnic on my lawn. At first, I thought they must have mistaken my property for a public park, so I went outside to politely inform them of their error. I approached the group and explained that there had been a misunderstanding, as this was actually my private property. The woman looked at me with a mixture of confusion and annoyance. She argued that the garden had always been a shared space for the neighborhood. I tried to clarify that I had just bought the house, and the backyard was part of my property. She insisted that she had been using the garden for years, and that ownership of the house didn't matter, as the space belonged to everyone. I was taken aback by her attitude, but tried to remain calm. I acknowledged that they might have used it when the house was vacant, but explained that it wasn't a public area. I politely asked if they could finish their picnic and then use the public park down the street in the future. Karen huffed and gathered her family, yelling about selfish newcomers as they left. Over the next few weeks, I frequently found Karen and other neighbors in my garden. They were picking vegetables, hosting gatherings, and even letting their kids play on my lawn. Each time I confronted them, they insisted it was a shared space and that they had been using it for years. The situation reached a boiling point when I came home from work one day to find my entire backyard decorated for a wedding. Rows of chairs were set up on the lawn, an arch stood near my prized rose bushes, and caterers were bustling about setting up tables. I asked what was going on. Karen cheerfully told me it was her niece's wedding, and asked it if I thought it was beautiful. I protested, saying she couldn't just host a wedding in my backyard but without asking. She dismissed my concerns, insisting that the garden had always been for community use and that my ownership of the house didn't change that. I said it was my property and they needed to leave immediately. Karen refused, claiming she had squatter's rights to the land and threatening to sue me if I tried to stop the wedding. I was at a loss. The wedding went ahead despite my protests, and I spent the evening watching strangers trample my flower beds and help themselves to my vegetable garden. The next day, I contacted a lawyer to understand my rights and how to handle the situation. While waiting for legal advice, Things took an even more bizarre turn. I noticed unfamiliar people in my garden, sunbathing and having picnics. When I confronted Karen about it, she proudly told me that she had started renting out her part of the garden to tourists through an online platform. Karen boasted about it being a great way to make extra money and suggested I should be thanking her for bringing business to the neighborhood. I told her she couldn't rent out my property. She maintained that it wasn't my property, claiming she had rights to it because she had been using it for years. She challenged me to take her to court if I didn't like it, and that's exactly what I did. With my lawyer's help, I filed a lawsuit against Karen for trespassing and unauthorized use of my property. The legal battle was stressful and expensive, but I was determined to reclaim my garden. During the court proceedings, it came to light the Karen had been taking advantage of the property's vacancy for years. She had gradually encroached on the space, convincing other neighbors it was a community area. Some of her renters even testified 
thinking they had been using a legitimate vacation rental. The judge was not amused by Karen's claims of squatters' rights and ruled in my favor. Not only was Karen ordered to cease all activities on my property immediately, but she was also required to pay damages for the destruction of my garden and the unauthorized rentals. To ensure there would be no further misunderstandings, the court mandated that I install a fence around my property, with Karen covering half the cost as part of the damages. The day the fence went up was one of the most satisfying of my life. I watched as Karen fumed from her porch, unable to set foot in the garden she had claimed as her own for so long. With my backyard finally secured, I set about restoring the garden to its former glory. I replanted the trampled flowers, nurtured the vegetable patches back to health, and added my own personal touches to make it truly mine. And every tomato I pluck from my garden tastes just a little bit sweeter, knowing it's truly mine to enjoy. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching, and see you next time. Thank you.